and we are, this is the second in our new series, the One Thing series. There are several times in the Bible the phrase one thing is used. And two or three weeks ago, we started with one thing I ask from Psalm 27. One thing I ask that I may see the Lord, may gaze on the be- in his beauty and in, in his temple and all the days of my life and seek him and I seek his face. We talked about that, and indeed, also, in addition, I, if you're interested, I started a podcast series based on Psalm 27, began last Thursday, uh, taking one verse at a time, plus an introduction to 15-week podcast series. If you want to tune into that, I'll give you the details later. Um, and as we get into today's topic, I realized this week and last week, preparing this lesson, I think this series, this One Thing series, for me, is the most challenging topic series I've taught for a long time. When I thought back to that first week of one thing I ask, I've been asking myself since then, is there really only one thing I really want? That to seek the Lord's face, to gaze on his beauty, to, to dwell with him. Is that truly the one thing I really seek? And today, I think this is a very challenging refreshing and exciting topic, but again, a very challenging topic. So I I share that to say I'm finding this challenging in preparing it as well as teaching it. And if you're finding it challenging as well, well, sometimes the best way that God helps us grow is by giving us the deepest challenges. And so I pray that we'll have enough spiritual strength for whatever God uh, sends our way. Now, you may notice that this passage about the, the ruler, the rich ruler, is the parallel passage to what Danny spoke on last week. He spoke from the Luke version. There are three times this story is in the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He did Luke, and this was not a coordinated thing. This was just one of those things that happens. And so we're going to look at the same events, but from Mark's perspective and from a slightly different angle. So I don't think there'll be too much duplication, but perhaps the uh, last week and this week will help enrich our understanding of what this is really all about, this encounter with Jesus. So I think we'll have our reading now. So if you wouldn't mind coming up and doing that for us, that would be super. Thank you. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why would you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left their, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Thank you. Thank you. Super reading. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, absolutely super. Thank you so much. Um, so let's now uh, go back to our passage and I want to read uh, the few verses that come before what EVA just read in verses 13 to 16. Let's have a quick look there because it's part of the context that I think is very important. So in verse 13, right before this man comes to Jesus, we have people bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. The disciples, uh, as often, are not in tune with Jesus and they rebuke these children or perhaps the the parents or the people bringing them. 
And Jesus sees that. And what is his reaction? Uh, he is appropriately indignant. Uh, he says to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Isn't that tremendous beauty in this scene here of Jesus welcoming, embracing? There's something very beautiful about what Jesus does here. He's very stern and very comforting in the same situation. Stern with the disciples, but so welcoming to the, uh, to the children. It's a wonderful thing. So what we have that right before the situation where the man who runs up to Jesus and falls on his knees. There's no coincidence there together. Whether they happen right after each other or whether Mark put them there editing things doesn't really matter. The point is, there's a contrast. There's a contrast between the children who lack the lack of the man who lacks the one thing. The children don't lack, the man does. The children have the one thing that the young man doesn't have. And what is that one thing? And that's the intriguing thing, isn't it? And we're going to look into that a little bit today. But today, the reason I wanted to put that in there, verses 13 to 16, about the children is because when you only look at the young man who falls on his knees, it can be a little bit like, oh dear, that's a bit of a negative story. You know, he walks away sad. But when you look at it in the context of the children, we see that the young man is not our role model, but the children are our role model. They're our role model in this. They understand something, they accept something that the educated, wealthy, privileged, impressive man does not. So these uninhibited children, these uncalculating children, these children want Jesus on his terms, not on their terms. And that's so much of what this is all about. So we're going to ask four quick questions today. Asagi, if you could do that next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, oh, that's the podcast. Okay. The next slide after that. Four simple questions. What does the man have? What does he lack? What is he missing out on? And what do we learn about Jesus from this? So first of all, what does the young man have? Tell me. What does he have or thinks he has or appears to have? What would you say he has? Money. Money. <laughs> Lots of money. Life, it's money. He's got plenty of money. He's wealthy. We know that from, of course, the parallel passages in Matthew and in Luke. He's young, wealthy. He's a leader as well. So, okay, he's wealthy. Yep. What else? Well he's well informed about. Well, he's a young woman. Okay. He's well informed about legislation, rules, um, things that goes on in society. Yeah, if you're going to be an effective ruler, you've got to know how to rule and what that takes and be well informed. Okay. Yeah. Successful. 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 Good point. He's wealthy. Whether he inherited it or earned it, he hasn't lost it. So at the very least, so he's successful. Yes. Power. Yes, he does. He has influence. He has power because he's a ruler and he's wealthy. So, Simon. I think he's polite. Well, polite manners. Yeah. And um, I think he's quite a Sounds like it. Yeah, of course, Jesus, good teacher. Is it flattery? Or is it politeness? We don't know exactly, right? But notice how after Jesus tells him who's good except no one except God alone, notice the next time the man addresses Jesus. He doesn't say good teacher. He says, oh, uh, teacher. <laughs> so he's learned already. So he's, he's paying attention to what Jesus is saying. Teacher, I've kept all these since I was a boy. All right. Yeah. What else? Emmy. He doesn't have a full understanding. Yeah. yeah. Which, of course, is the case for almost everybody around Jesus at that point. Yeah, there's a lack of full understanding. What else does he have? I think he has a desire to desire for eternal life. Yeah, he has motivation to come to Jesus and to, uh, and to ask for something. He wants 
eternal life, whatever that means, which of course is not explained here. And his understanding of that is probably different to what Jesus is thinking about. But nonetheless, he has a question. Yes. Yeah, otherwise why come? Right? Yeah. He's obviously not thinking I'm okay completely, or he wouldn't ask this question. Hmm. Uh, sorry, Patricia. Right, he's got courage, humility, falling on his knees. He's not bothered about the fact he's going to have to go home and wash his knees. All right, he's, he's, he's got some, he's paying some price for this encounter with Jesus, right? He's paying a price. So he's got enough humility and courage to take this approach. Anything else? He's, he's got a lot going for him, isn't he? He's, he's doing well in society. He's doing well financially. He's also doing well doing spiritually, in a sense, with the rules, right? He's kept all these since I was a boy. Wow. My you, he hasn't listed all of the commandments, has he? He's been selective. And we don't know exactly why, but maybe he left out the ones he's been struggling with. In fact, he adds one in because the one about defrauding isn't in the original Ten Commandments. So it's interesting how he's reshaped it a little bit. We'll have, do we have to debate that another time when it's not so hot? We'll have more time and energy. But he does keep the rules. He seems to be doing well spiritually. He is a leader in the synagogue, it appears. So at every level, he's successful. He looks right. He sounds right. He does the right actions. He seems to be blessed by, the, as far as the culture around him is concerned, he is blessed. He is righteous because God blesses the righteous, right? God gives wealth to the, the righteous. That's the prevailing idea at the time. And if you're poor, that must be because you've been a sinner. You haven't been making the right sacrifices. You haven't been behaving yourself. Maybe you weren't turning up at the synagogue. Maybe, I mean, who knows what's going on, but he's wealthy. Therefore, he must be right with God. And, and that the people of the day think back to Solomon, right? Solomon was the wealthiest king in Israel's history. And, and Israel had a selective memory about that. They were like, that's it. If someone's wealthy, it's like Solomon. Solomon was blessed by God with all that wealth. But they forget, of course, that part of the reason that Solomon messed up spiritually was because of his wealth. We have selective memories about some of these things. The thing about him is he comes with humility, but he doesn't come with a fully surrendered soul. He doesn't come with that. He comes with, apparently, a love for money and a love for the rules. But although he asks a good question, how can I inherit eternal life? There's something else going on inside that means he's not prepared for the answer that he doesn't like. So what does he lack? What else, apart from what we've already talked about, does he lack? Dependence from God. Dependence on God. All right, yes. Seen, seen all great things because that's what told it doesn't lack that ability to see where he's failing. Okay, he doesn't see where he's failing. He lacks insight. And he's not allowing Jesus to give him insight, sadly. Right. Yes, good. What else does he lack? What do we think? Patricia. Okay, what faith and trust in God really means. Yes, John. Just want to add what uh, Sarah said about faith. Maybe he's struggling to accept the fact that he can fail. Oh, right. He doesn't. He doesn't want to believe or accept that he can fail. Isn't that a tough one? Uh, for, for everybody else, I've never struggled with that. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a tough one to, to handle. Simon? He hasn't got an openness to change. Okay. He hasn't got an openness to change. At least change that compromises things that he doesn't want to change. Maybe he'd be willing to change some other things. But the, the things that need to change, no, you're right. In lack of willingness or openness to change. Anything else? Think about, for a minute, the difference between this man and those who actually became disciples. What's the difference between him and Peter, James, John, Andrew, Nathaniel? Yeah? I think he also didn't see his needs. You know, like what Barry was sharing earlier, like uh, just that sort of not seeing needs. 
He doesn't see his need for God. He, he just needs um, something to acquire. Something to acquire. Okay. Ah. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because he goes to Jesus, but he doesn't go beyond that encounter to further towards God because he doesn't have that willingness. Good point. Somebody over here said something. So go on. He wasn't prepared to give up. This scene is really interesting when you put it alongside the scene by the lake when Jesus calls the first disciples and they leave the nets and they leave the boats and they leave the family business, James and John's family business. It's a really interesting contrast. Yeah. Yeah. All right. He lacks the courage of his convictions. It sounds like he has conviction, but does he really? Yeah, lacking that courage. He lacks a few things. He really, he, yes, Chris? Sorry, he's just, he's just thinking, because he's so rich, he always got what he wanted. So when he came to Jesus, he didn't have to go and ask for it. Because he was rich, when you're used to getting your own way, yeah. because you've got power or you've got wealth or you've got position or you've got whatever you've got, talents, and you're used to getting your own way, then you come up against somebody who doesn't fall for how impressive that is, not intimidated by you, and they tell you something you need to hear. It's a really shocking feeling. Hmm, good point. Simon, something else? Yeah, sorry. Go on. I actually think that's faith. Ah, um, okay, go on, faith. Um, because he doesn't see that his wealth is less than what Jesus has to offer. Yeah. It's, his wealth is less than what Jesus is offering him. Now, isn't that a counterintuitive, topsy-turvy, kingdom of God turning things upside down kind of thing, right? It, it is worth more, but he can't see it. Sad, isn't it? It's very tragic. He does lack faith, I think. He lacks love for God. He lacks the heart of the disciple. And he lacks, somebody said, trust, I think, in Jesus. Um, he, he, uh, he, he fundamentally falls at the test of whether he loves Jesus more than anything or anyone else. He lacks a willingness to change, as somebody said. He doesn't want his life shaken up. He uh, doesn't want his paradigm of life changed. His priorities changed. He doesn't want his religion redefined. He doesn't want his understanding of the kingdom and eternal life to be redefined. He doesn't want, ultimately, true discipleship. It's really a passage about discipleship. So what's he going to miss out on as a result? Right, what do you think? What's he going to miss? Eternal life itself. He's asking for eternal life, and ironically, he's going to miss it. Okay. What else is he going to miss? Chris? That's a relationship. Ah, yeah. Missing the relationship. Remember, he's good at the rules, but he's going to miss the relationship. Yeah. Isn't that, just make a quick comment. Isn't that sadly like a lot of what passes for Christianity today? I'm not pointing a finger at any individual because I don't know about the individuals, but it's true for many we might know that, that it's about not about Jesus and a relationship with God. And that's a sad situation. Anyway, what else uh, is he missing out on? Um, he's missing out on the main point that he is not able uh, to get eternal life uh, relying on himself, uh-huh. on the rules, without Jesus. Uh, yes. It's not his responsibility. No, he's not going to get eternal life by doing the things that he has decided he's going to do. Yeah. Good. Okay. What else is he missing out on? Changing himself for the better, learning humility and not relying on things for himself. He's missing out on growth. Isn't it really? He's missing out on the opportunity to grow as a person and as someone who loves God. And it comes through pain. I must admit, you know, I look back on my Christian life 
And most of the times when I think I grew the most were the times that I would rather not ever repeat again because they were too painful. It's often the pain, the difficulty caused by our own sin or caused by others sinning against us or caused by problems, just things in life, illnesses, bereavements, things we grieve over. Those tend to be often the times we grow the most. And if we don't embrace them, I was talking to a friend of mine this week. I have an old university friend called Lawrence. He's not a believer, but we talk about faith and spiritual issues. And we've known each other for 40 years. Gosh, yes, 40, 41 years, my word. And uh, he had a stroke three or four years ago. He's a year younger than me. He's a musician, a composer, a pianist, a conductor, a, 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 a professor of music at Ulster University. That stroke, when he was 50... I would say 55 or something, meant he can't ever work again. He can't compose, he can't write, he can't play the piano, he can't lecture, he can't, he can't arrange music. He worked top level. He worked with Andrew Lloyd Webber. He supervised uh, productions of The Phantom of the Opera. I mean, this is a chap top of his game. He has modern music, writes, he writes modern music. He gets performed all over the world. He wrote, some, uh, he wrote a play about Marlene Dietrich that ran for many uh, months in the West End and transferred to Germany. I mean, this is a very, he, he, within his own circles, he's very famous. You wouldn't have heard the name because he's more the writer behind these things. Amazing fellow. They had the stroke. I went to visit him as soon as I heard about it um, at the time, and he was in remarkable spirits considering all this. He's made some recovery. We were talking this week. And, um, but he's still never going to be able to do all the things that brought him joy. But as we talked, he said, you know, Malcolm, he said, uh, he said, I, I'm determined I'm not a victim. I'm not going to let this, di di let this dictate the rest of my life and how I feel. There are so many things I can still do. I can go for walks. He says, amazing, I can walk. I can go for walks. He's got an art collection. He says, I can sit and look at my, he's got a Picasso, an original. It's that kind of chap. And uh, I asked him if he would put that in, the, in his will for me, but uh, um, <laughs> no, I didn't. He, uh, he said, I can sit and look at my Picasso. I can listen to music and I can evaluate it still. And I've got all these things I can do and I can talk to you, my friend. And if I, I've got to not miss the gifts that are still here. And it, we had this conversation about gifts and how often the greatest gifts that God gives us, I would say God gives us, he wouldn't say God, but nonetheless, he sees things from a spiritual perspective. The greatest gifts we're often given are, are, are encapsulated within a great deal of pain. And it's like that for this man. The greatest gift he could have received was wrapped up in the pain of giving up everything, selling everything, giving it to the poor, following Jesus. But then he missed out on everything. What a shame. What a shame. So what do we learn about Jesus? We've learned a lot about the man, but we need to think a bit about what we learn about Jesus, because this isn't all about this man. It's about Jesus. So what do we take from this passage? About Jesus, the way that he dealt with the children, the way that he dealt with the man, and the way that he spoke to his disciples afterwards about the fact that they will receive a hundred times what they're giving up. What do we learn about our Lord? What do you think? What do we learn about him? He was trying, wasn't he? He really did love him. He, it says in verse 29, not verse 29, in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then it says again in verse 27, Jesus looked at them, his disciples. The young man was confused. The disciples got a bit confused. He looked at them. It implies that he took a breath. He paused before answering. He looked at them because he wanted them to know, okay, I'm going to say something that's for your benefit. This is for you. Yeah, he's loving in that way. What else do we learn about Jesus? Jesus. 
Has to be personal. Okay, so we're learning a lot about the heart of Jesus here, and 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 the difference between what it means to know Him when we have our agenda and what it means to know him when we let him set the agenda. And the disciples are the ones who have actually let him do that. Okay, anything else about Jesus? So, he may have done. We don't know. Quite right, we don't know. Simon? Um, yeah, there's no double standards here. You know, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. No double standards, yeah. Yeah, no, they say the same kind of expectations of the disciples he has of anybody who comes to him. The, the actual specifics of the situation will vary from person to person, but but the same standards, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, let's take communion together. I think wrapping up and thinking about all this. <laughs> they, uh, the disciples are, are dismayed when Jesus says to enter the kingdom of heaven is... Uh, really, really hard. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's, that's how difficult it is. And the disciples' response is to be amazed, gobsmacked. I mean, they are, the word actually is the same word when someone collapses on the floor. So they're like, they just, they're like falling on the floor with, what? And who then can be saved? And Jesus reassures them, you can't do it, but with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with him. So they're called to trust that God can give them the rewards that may not all come right now, but they will be coming. And in this life, we will get many of those rewards or blessings. A hundred times, homes and brothers and sisters and mothers and so on. That comes to us in real Christian fellowship. It doesn't come by attendance, but it does come by being in fellowship with one another in the kind of community that is a kingdom of God community. Loving, forgiving, supportive, patient, all the fruit of the Spirit displayed amongst one another for one another's benefit and the glory of God. Jesus wants the best for us. He wanted the best for this man. Sadly, the man couldn't accept, couldn't accept the cost and missed, missed the prize eternal life in the kingdom. In the compassion of Jesus, he warned the man and he invited him to follow. And in his compassion, of course, he died for this man, just like he died for you and me. Right after this incident, they go up to Jerusalem and Jesus is telling his disciples that he will be delivered to the chief priests, that they will condemn him to death. They'll hand him to the Gentiles mock him, spit him, flog him, and kill him, three days later, he'll rise. It's going to be tough, but it's going to be worth it. And we take bread and wine, we take that these, these emblems to remind us that Jesus did that for us. He did that in compassion. And even today, he continues to warn us and others to not miss that one thing, to not lack that one thing. The willingness to let Jesus set the agenda for our best, that's in our best interest. The challenges he gives us because he loves us. Let's pray together.